Good morning. Good morning, good day, and welcome to those of you that are here and those of you that are joining us from around the world, wherever you are joining us from at this time. It's good to have you doing so, not because of me or anyone in this room, if, even if they're thinking so, I am going to destroy it. The reason why I am in this room standing in front of these cameras that you are seeing and hearing the stream from those of you that are listening by way of radio, it's because of God. If you don't want to believe that, I can't do anything about it, but I know. I should know that. Um, it's important for those whom God sent for them to know. And, that's, and, and as a matter of fact, God would not send anyone who does not have that understanding because he would not trust them to represent him if they doesn't know that. We think of even John the Baptist. When they sent, the Pharisees sent to find out who he was. Why are you preaching the message that you're preaching? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? When they ask, are you the Christ? No, I am not. Are you that prophet? That prophet? No, I am not. Are you Elijah? No, I am not. And who are you? I'm only the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare, prepare you the way of the Lord and make his path straight. He knew who he was. And when you know who you are, then it allows you to be effective in what you are representing. So I pray that as you take the time to be a part of this gathering, and those of you that are watching and listening, that it will not be a religious moment for you, but a life encounter with the living God that literally transforms your life to the point that it's impossible for you to go back to being what you were before. And that is possible. It is possible. So we're going to take a minute or so to pray together. But before we do, I want to continue sharing little nuggets, if you may, about prayer. Persons have been reaching out to me online, from online and even here, asking about prayer. <sighs> I think about this and that every single thing, every single doctrine, even the elementary principles that we should have known from the very initial stage of our faith in Christ needs to be taught. Therefore, we put a greater burden, a greater weight on my shoulder. Because it's not a lot of us, not a lot like me is out there. YouTube is a mess with many of these persons who say that they are preaching or teaching. And one of the things that we must be very mindful of, that YouTube now has become a huge marketplace. It's a money-making platform. So even the preachers that are there, you have to be, you, when, you listen, when you see them, the first question you have to ask are they here to really, truly represent God or to make money? To make money. And when you understand what is required of us coming to faith in Christ, we cannot play, cannot play around. And you cannot invite any and anyone to speak into your life. You cannot invite any and anyone to speak into your life. In the book of John, 1 John, I think, or 2 John, where John said that anyone who comes to you not bringing this doctrine, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said you should not even invite them into your house. And when you tell them that you're not going to allow them to come into your house and they're leaving, he said, don't even bid them farewell. Lest you be partakers 
of their evil deeds. I've, I've watched many. We don't take those things serious. I don't know if we know that that's there. And for those of us who hear it, we have even read it, we don't take it serious. And so, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have done it before, and I don't know if I need to do that. Take a series about prior. Shouldn't be, but there's a need for it. Lord, help me. There's a need for it. And so we're not going to waste time when we come together in this meeting singing songs. I said it. I'm going to repeat myself. We're not going to waste time singing songs. Because when we do what we do where, we see what we're, where church is concerned today, the whole idea of singing songs, it's about entertainment. It's about making people feel good so that they will come back to my meeting. And, and what, what, why would you want them to come back? Think about it. If you, if, you, if, you, if you as a pastor or a preacher or whatever, you do things to make people come back, what's the motive? Oh, you don't know? You want me to come around? <laughs> this is the reason why. They don't care about their soul. They don't care whether they go to hell or, or what. All they care about is the money that they're making when the crowd shows up. So I don't care if you're upset, if you're offended, if you're... I, I don't care. Truth is necessary. And if there is a time that it is more necessary is now. And I've watched, I've listened. And I've seen and, and I've been a part of many so-called prayer meetings. I have been to a few prayer vigil. Oh, wow. Every year in Jamaica, the beginning of the year, in the month of January, they have the Governor General's prayer vigil. Nonsense, garbage, foolishness, religion, and that's all that it is. They gather at the there sometimes they'll have it at the Pegasus, Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. And it's all because of the food why people show up. Because it's a prior breakfast. I don't know where that come from. I will never host one. Notice prior breakfast. Prior and Nehemiah's. It's, that's why a lot of the people show up. They, they, don't not, they don't understand anything about prayer. We don't care about, we don't care about engaging God. And they claim that when they have these prayer vigil if the, in, in the month of January, every year, it has been going on for many years now. I, I, it, it, was, it started with um, Sir Howard Cook. He was the governor general at that time. I think... Um, it was the then Prime Minister P.J. Patterson that was, in, 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 that was the Prime Minister then. So he was the Governor General then. So he started it and it continues. So it becomes a tradition. So whoever comes in after, they continue it. But it's powerless. It has not done anything. And if any of you in Jamaica watching me, even I hope the Governor General is watching me. If you want to tell me that it has done anything, show me. Prove it to me. What has it done? Countries as corrupt as ever. The politicians are becoming more corrupt. Even the Prime Minister claimed to be a Seventh-day Adventist. When you tell me that you're a Seventh-day Adventist, it doesn't move me. Because Seventh-day Adventist people are some of the worst people that you can encounter. All they care about is keeping the seventh 
day holy. And that's it. And I need to teach them a thing or two about that seventh day because they don't understand it. But let us talk about prayer. I want to go back to Luke, or I can even go to Matthew chapter 6. But we read last week from Luke chapter 11. And while you're looking for that, I want to share a few verses. Jesus speaking in one. The Apostle Paul, of course, is still Christ speaking. Because the apostles, they give freedom for Christ to speak through them. And in the book of Jude, in John chapter 16, while you're looking for, which one did I tell you to go to? Matthew chapter 6? Mm. Luke 11. Go to Luke 11. So in, in John chapter 16, verse 24... Jesus knew that his hour to die on the cross was getting closer, very close. And he knew more than anyone else. Even the apostles, the disciples that were with him, though he had told them on many occasions, they didn't believe it because they didn't want him to die. They didn't want him to leave them. They wanted him to stay with them forever. But he knew he came for this particular reason. So getting close to that moment, he said to them in John chapter 16, verse 24, Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Because everything that they needed, Jesus would do it. Jesus would you know, we see the miracles, all of that, everything. They were protected, name it. They never needed to ask anything in his name. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. He says, and you will receive, he says, asked and you will receive, notice this. That, that's what I'm saying to us. We cannot just do prayer as we did it before. He says, ask and you will receive. Ask and you will receive. And hear this. That your joy may be full. Wow. Wow. So a part of the reward of prayer is experiencing fullness of joy. When last have you prayed and experienced that? The next one in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, it says, Praying always. This, this did something for my prayer life many, many years ago while I was in Jamaica. Because after I got born again and I came into the church and be a part of the denomination that I was a part of, when you go into the church building, the moment you come through the doors, the, the, the building, it had uh, uh, four sets of doors. The front door, the main door. The sides has two doors, each side has a door, and then at the back there's a door. So the main door was the one that we would enter in. They had a, 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 a box, and there were cushions, or we, they call them pads, kneeling pads. So as you come in, and I came in and I saw it, so I just monkey see, monkey do. As you come in, you would take one of the pads, and you go straight up to what they call the altar, and you put your pad in. You don't, you don't pray out loud. You just up there and you. I don't know what they were saying. So me go up there now. Me no know with it. So me just. <laughs> and then you finish and you take your pad and you go back and you put it in the box and you go and you sit down. And then after you sit down for a minute now, the time come for, for the meeting to start, they sing consecration songs. 
And one of the main ones, consecrate, because, you know, it's consecration time. Lord, to your service, and da-da-da-da. And we, we do all those stuff. And it was... Hmm. So, so before I, I, I came into the church and see the whole concept of you kneeling down when you pray, before that, we were told, clasp your hands and close your eyes. And there's this thing today that some, some of you are believers, you even go out and buy it. It is called the prior hands. Garbage, idolatry. If you have any in your house, you need to go home today and throw it away. It's idolatry. There's no prior hands. You notice many of the pictures that they show us with the so-called sissy Jesus. He always has his hands clasped. And he's, he's constantly praying, right? With his blue hide, blonde hair. You know, when you see the nail prints in his hands and the prior hands. You think that because you have the prior hands, things are going to nicely work out for you come on people please hear me today hear me it says praying always so this changed my mindset because i thought that in order for this to be true i needed to be kneeling down at all times because we have been told that if you're going to pray you need to be kneeling down whether you kneel at your bedside you kneel somewhere but and i remember we went to this place And I'm trying to remember if I was the one that was there to do the meetings for that week or there was another preacher or something. But I remember one day we went out on the road and we claimed that we were doing witnessing. So we went into a shop and shops in Jamaica in the country, they're varied. I mean, some of them are made out of zinc some made out of wood, some made out of bamboo and stuff like that. And there was this shop, little, little bit of shop, you know, and the floor, it was messy and stuff like that. And we got to the point where after we finished talking to the shopkeeper, shop owner, we, they said that we're going to pray. And there was this lady with us. The lady kneeled down. And at that time, it didn't bother me because I too thought that if you're going to pray, it's either the prior hands or the kneeling down. Did you know that there is no prescribed position of prayer in the Bible? Me say, do you know that there is no prescribed position of prayer in the Bible? It, there is no commandment that when you're praying you should kneel down. Or stand up or whatever. There's none. So how do we come up with these things? Where did they come from? Praying always. So now when I read this the first time Sister Kim. I am thinking that I would always have to be on my knees. Down on my knees. I learned to pray. Huh. And I can't even walk without him holding my hands. Hmm. Praying always. What does that look like? Praying always. Always. So if, 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 if it's a prayer hand, you'd have to be walking around, you know, even. What would you do? Because if you're praying always, how would you eat? How would you bathe? How would you do stuff? Because you're not praying always. So the moment they see you, you have some people, they dress in some frock looking clothes and this is how they literally walk around. Blessing my brother. Peace be unto you. You know them? You've never seen any of them? Monks. This is how they literally, and they have some beads around there, and they literally walk around like this. When they sit, they sit in a 
You say, if me young enough. <laughs> I ain't going to try it now, but they're sitting at a kind of a position. Have, have you ever seen a, a picture of the Buddha? And they, they're sitting, and, and this is how they literally, and they believe that in doing that, you know, they're constantly in a certain Oh, Father, help us. You have already helped us. May we receive it. Praying always. Watch this. With all prayer. All prayer. And supplication in the spirit. How do you pray in the spirit? Again, tongues can be a part of it. But tongues is not the end of praying in the spirit. Being, notice now, in, in, in your attitude of prayer, because there has to be a mindset, it's a being watchful to this end. All, with all perseverance, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then in the book of Jude, chapter 1, and of course, it's only one chapter, but reference sake, verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up. Notice, note the term, notice the statement here. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Spirit, building yourself up. So what I want you to see and get here, that any time you engage prior, God expects you to come into something. God expects you to experience something. God expects you to activate something. But you, beloved, building up yourself. Notice, building up yourself in your most holy faith. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Because after a while, certain things started to bother me. And I look at my prior life. I look at how we do prior. You know, every Monday we have this. Every Friday evening we have this, you know, we have all these programs and they make you feel guilty if you didn't show up for one of them. Where were you? Because nothing to them, nothing more is, is more important than doing that. And I've seen marriages fall apart. I've seen family fall apart because you have some wives every time the church door open, they're present. The husband want them to stay home and spend one evening. No, I have to go to church. <laughs> I I made this statement. Just going to look at one more thing from there. Framework. The model prayer, what we call the Our Father prayer, it's not the Our Father prayer. What we call the Lord's prayer is not the Lord's prayer. It's a framework that Jesus Christ himself Jesus Christ himself applied to his life. And he gave it to the disciples then and disciples today. That every time we use it, we are supposed to get heavenly results. Everything around you has a framework. In computing, there is a framework. The apps that you use on your phone, the apps that you use on your computer, there is a framework that the software, am I right, sir? That the software is built around. And so code, 
codes are now added to around that framework to develop the software. The software has a framework. That without a framework, it can't be. And so as frameworks exist everywhere in the natural, likewise in the spirit, and that's where it first begun. So Jesus gives us a framework, not for you to repeat it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it, and and some, you hear some people then just repeat and just race through it. And believe that when I pray it, something magical is going to happen to me. Some people even have the printout of it in their house. <laughs> I bet you that somebody in this room have, <laughs> have a printout of it in their house. You, you want to bet me? Huh? They have it on a plaque. Huh? Somehow, wherever, they have it. They have it. Somebody in the... I don't need to have it hung up in my house. Have it hanging up in my house is not going to do me anything. It's knowing. Because where computing is concerned, if I don't know coding, I can't do anything in building a, a app. So I would have to learn. And once I learn that and know how to use it, then the framework gives me the ability to do what I'm doing. That's what Jesus did in this when he taught the disciples not what to pray, but how to pray. Last week I shared with you the first part of the framework is our Father who art in heaven. That's the main part of the framework. If you leave that part out, the rest is corrupt. Our Father in heaven. I was walking through, or I was doing something in, the, in our basement, and a lot of you, 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 you're acquainted with basements here. It is not a big thing in Jamaica. It's when I came here, I hear them talking about basement, basement, basement. And our basement is what they call unfinished. So it's raw. You're seeing, you look up in the top and you're seeing everything. And then there is this, there is this column that as you come down the stairs, you know, you come through the, the, the door that, and you go down the stairs. And as you turn, and then me, you know, a lot of times I turn, this thing that's right in front of you saying good morning or whatever time of the day you're going to the basement. It's always there greeting you. And I'm thinking about it, I wonder if this could be removed. All right, all right now, all right. I, I, I'm getting you, I'm getting you now. I'm getting you now. And Brother Patrick, when I look at it, and I look across, and I look across, the, 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 they, have a, they have a few main metal, higher and huge, heavy stuff that they had to use crane to lift those to put across there. And that column, it sits right in the middle to bear. So if you move it, <laughs> our Father is the main, the main column. I want to help somebody today to pray with power from this time forth. And for the rest of your life. So if you remove 
the father out of the equation, the framework is corrupt. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. So even if you decide that, okay, you know, you want to finish the basement and you want to, and so you said to them, said, you know what, I would like for that column. Not even the person that is going to do the building would, they, they said, no, you can't touch that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, that column is very, very, very important to the entire structure. And then after they put these metal pieces, then they have these huge, thick piece of board that has a, a yellow-looking yellow color to it. And, and they go across, and those, those are the strength of the foundation of the house. That if you mess with them, I've been asking the question for a long time, a long time. Why is this so? When I read the scriptures, I am not seeing that. I'm seeing something completely opposite. And this become the norm. That when we say we're going to pray, people don't even think. We just get up and we just, we just, we just switch on the prayer mode. And we're gone. Hey, Lord. Oh, God. I'm a worm. I'm a dog. I'm not worthy. Oh, God. And we get into the prayer mode. You know. Hey, ya, ha, ha. Oh, ya, ho, ho. Ya, ha, ha. Ya, ha, ho. Shabba, shabba. We have all kind of prayer mode in the church. Yeah? You ever listen sometime how some of us are going? There is no power. The moment we hear prayer, it's like something just switch on. And we just get in there and shabba shabba. Chill the Lord. <laughs> I've got to stop it. When the church in the book of Acts prayed, when the church in the book of Acts prayed, I said when the church in the book of Acts prayed, things happened. Whew. Things happened, Sister Kim. And that church needs to come back alive. That church is the church that will prepare the way for the Lord to return. Not the present framework that we're seeing now. It's religious. It has to be that which comes to us from the kingdom. Our Father in heaven. Touch the person beside you. If someone is beside you, if you're close enough, and said, that's the main column. Stand with me, if you may, please, as we pray together. A brother from the States reached out to me a few days ago, asking me about what I think about um, uh, devotional, oh boy. You know these, they have these devotional, and, and there's a lot of them out there. So it starts out with uh, sometimes a scripture verse, there's an inspiration, and then there's a prayer. Anybody remember those? Or you, you still do it? There was um, the first one I was introduced to, I think, the first one I was introduced to after I came into the church was, was a, 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 I think it was for a year or either six months. I think it was for a year. It was done by this um, organization called Back to the Bible. So it's called Daily Bread. Daily Bread. 
So it's, it's, it's structured in a way where it, it allows you to read through the Bible throughout the year. And they break down, you know, the scriptures. And then they have the part now where there's a scripture verse. They say something, you know, kind of an inspiration. And then there's a prayer at the bottom. And the prayer is based on what the verse of scripture is or whatever within the inspiration. And you simply repeat it. Do you think that's prayer? You're praying what somebody else write. And who wrote it? There are some places where they have prayer books. So it depends on what's going on. It depends on what you want. So if you want a man, <laughs> you, 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 look, you look for the heading, how to find a good man or a husband or whatever. And then they're giving you scripture verses now to, and you read that and then they give you a prayer. Oh Lord, God, sovereign God of the universe, you see and know that I am so lonely and I need a man in my life. You who created man in the beginning and you gave man a wife, I need a man. Lord, today, let us thou, let us a man pass, cross path with me. Show us me that man. Lord, let that man wear a red, red, red shirt. Oh, Father, and I will know that that is the man. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, the devil hear you pray that. You know how many men he's going to inspire to wear a red shirt? And you're going to square one and you're going up the escalator and there comes this red shirt man coming down on the other side. Oh, wow. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So as we pray... In this very moment, those of you that are watching and listening, as we pray, let us rearrange the framework that was given to us by traditions of men and the religiosity of church. Don't even rearrange it. Tear it down. Destroy it and rebuild. Use the materials that God has given to us to rebuild that framework. And it starts around God being Father. So what are you supposed to be thinking about him right now? Every time you read it in the Bible and you see the word God, you need to see the image of Father. 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 Go ahead and talk to the Father in this moment. Pray into why we are coming together. Pray for each other. What is it that you would want to see another brother, a sister comes into? What is it that is happening in this room that you know it's of God and you want yourself and others to be in it? You want them to get it. You want them to grow in it. Pray for, the, for those that are watching online. Even if you have never met them, you don't know of them, they're there. Pray for them. What would, what, what would you pray for them? And pray and continue to keep the ministry in Jamaica also. Some of you have been down there. You have been to even the very spot where it all started out. And so continue to pray for them that they will stay in tune and stay in, line, in alignment with what God raised up this ministry for in these end times. Pray. Go ahead and talk to the Father. Go. Father, Father in heaven. Father in heaven. That's not a religious statement, Lord. That's not a religious statement. That is a statement of power. It's a statement of eternity. It's a statement of what is <laughs> The foundation of not only how we should pray, but it's the very foundation of creation. It is at the foundation of everything that was created. It is at the foundation of the existence of who you are. 
You created man as your son. So therefore, the reason why that came to be, it's because you, you are father. Father you are. Father, father, father. And there is an eternal son that allowed that to be constituted and continue to exist. That before anything was created, there was a son in the bosom of the father, in the bosom of the father. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, his Father, his Father. And that's what creation is about. That's why we exist, to recognize him as Father, so that he can show off his fatherhood in and through our lives. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, that in my mind and in my spirit I know where to locate him. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done, what you have established in yourself, concluded in yourself even before the foundation of the world. We were predestined in Christ Jesus to the adoption of sons before the foundation of the world. Father, thank you for what you have done. And because we were predestined, because you foreknew us, you predestined us. And because you predestined us, you called us. And because you called us, we responded to the call, you justified us. And because you justified us, oh, Father, and we received being justified, you glorified us so that we may conform to the image of you your son. Oh, Father, thank you for what you have done and what you are doing and what you will continue to do in our lives when we see ourselves as sons, when we see you as father. Father, the very creation was created around that idea that even when man sinned, you put the creation, you subjected the creation in futility. The creation did not end up in that state voluntarily. It didn't happen automatically. You submitted the creation in hope, in hope, in hope that in the glorious liberty of the sons, when we receive our sonship, oh, the very creation continues to groan. It continues to expect. There is an expectation waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God the sons of God and if we are sons you are father if we are sons you are father if we are sons you are father you sent your son into this world and he came unto his own and his own did not receive him but as many as receive him to them you gave the right to become sons of God sons of God Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And it, do it, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. Behold what manner of love the Father, the Father, not just God, the Father has bestowed upon us, lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, sons of God. Father, thank you for what you have done. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you have called us to be. Thank you that you have put everything in place that is necessary for us to see you as Father, that is necessary for us to come into sonship. That is not something I am making up. It's not something I'm conjuring up. It's not something I'm imposing on you. You are the one who presented it to us. That's how you introduce yourself. That's how you introduce yourself to creation. You would introduce yourself to creation as father. Whoa, because the very first man that was made, he was the son of God. So father, thank you for what you have restored through Christ. 
our sonship that was lost in the first Adam is perfectly restored in Christ. So with boldness I come and I cry, Abba. With boldness I come and I cry, Abba. I recognize that you are my Abba. I recognize that you are the source of who I am. I recognize that you are the source of my being, the source of my identity, the source of my existence in time, the source of my life in every sense of the word. And so when I see you and I acknowledge you as Father, there is no luck. When I see you as Father, that there is no luck. When I see you as father, there is no luck. The reason why we suffer luck is because we don't see you as father and we end up being orphans. And if we're orphans, there is a lot of needs. If we're orphans, there's a lot of needs. There are so many fears, anxieties, worries, uncertainties. But when we see you as father, there is no luck. Because when we see you as Father, we come as sons saying to you, give us this day, give us this day, give us this day, give me this day my daily bread. Because with the Father, with the Father, there is daily provision, daily provision. And the kind of father that you are, it's a, you're, a, you're the kind of father that doesn't leave your children nor forsake them. You're the kind of father that never, ever stop thinking about your children. You are ever mindful of your children. You even, as you have gone as far as to write, you don't need to do it, but to show us it, that is for our purposes, that is for our sake. That you said that, you asked a question, can a mother, can a mother forget the nurse or nursing child that she gave birth to? You said, yet she may forget. And Father, we've seen time, many times where mothers have forgotten their children. But you said, I, the Lord, your God, I, your Father, will never forget. I have engraved your names in the palm of my hands. Oh, Father, 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 you are. Father. I pray that for those of us, Lord, who have not yet gotten that revelation, because, Lord, even though I said it, even though I've been saying it, until it is revealed, we will never get it. Jesus, you even said that no man knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son but the Father. And to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus, my father, my, my, my brother, my brother, my elder brother, I am asking you today. For someone in this room and for those that are watching and listening. Reveal the father to them. Reveal the father to us. Reveal the father to us. Reveal the father to us. Because the Lord, it is the main framework. That if we go off building without that being at the center, what we are building is inevitable. That it will crumble at some point. And so Father, today, may we understand that this is not a joke. This is not a made up doctrine made up sermon this is at the heart 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 of creation this is at the heart of everything existing around us father your word says jesus said to us jesus said jesus said Jesus said, Jesus said, do not worry about what you should eat, what you should drink, or what you should wear. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Think of the birds. Your Father provides for them, and you are of more value. 
much more value than the birds. Father in heaven, thank you for shifting our mindsets as we hear truth and receive it. Thank you for the word that is going forth, rooting up, tearing down, casting down, and replanting, replanting, so that we can function effectively in time on the earth as sons of the living God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You are Father. You are Father. Heal us of the contamination of what Father is and who a Father really is and what that means and what it looks like. The enemy attacked fatherhood in the garden and we continue to see the after effects of it. But so many of us, Lord, we grew up without a father. Many of us who grew up with a father, we'd never experience a proper father. And as a result of that, it tarnished the idea of a father. But Father, you are able to heal us. You are able to heal us and allow us to see you rightly and allow us to experience you rightly. So thank you for healing. Thank you for healing our thoughts, our minds, our being and restoring, restoring, restoring. Restoring us to you as Father. Let it be, let it be, let it be. Let it be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing and thank you for answering. In the name of Jesus the Christ, your Son. Your Son. Amen. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for healing. Thank you for healing of the mind, healing of the heart. The greater healing, Lord, the greater healing. And you are the healer. You're the healer. Thank 
Thank you, Father. Be seated if you can, please. Don't take this statement lightly. The purpose, uh, I would say the driving purpose of this ministry is to equip the sons of God for effective kingdom living. That's not a religious statement. I don't do religion. Not in speech, not in my thinking, not in my speech, not in my action. I have tasted it. It is poisonous. It is bondage. And it leads to death. It leads to death. But the kingdom of God has absolutely nothing to do with religion. Kingdom of God gives us divine access to who he is. Because God existing as Father, His kingship is the authority and power that supports this idea. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Notice, your kingdom come. Your reign, your rule comes and at the end of it the framework he says for yours is the kingdom the power and the glory for how long forever and ever because it did not start in time it started before time. So when time as we know it is folded up like a garment and put aside, it continues. His fatherhood will continue. Jesus said in the book of Revelation that for those of us who have come to faith in him and we continue to the very end, he says, I will give you a new name. I will give you a new name. Wow. Wow. The name is not Angela or Kim or Marcella. That's not what it's talking about. And it's connected to God as Father. I will give you a new name. I think he said that there is a stone <laughs> with your name written on it. Wow. Not a physical stone. So we need to really stop and think about it. That if you say that you're a part of this ministry, you're not going to hear anything else. Because that's what we're supposed to come into. That's who we ought to be. Sons of God. Not Baptists. Not Anglicans. Not Methodists or Catholics or... The, the bondage that has been presented to people. And many people are literally fighting and defending it. And there's no life in it. I'm going to ask two persons to come and read. I think it's the last chapter of the book of John, right? The last time we had the reading was, I think, chapter 20, right? So today we're going to read chapters 21, chapter 21. The last chapter in the book of John, 
Those of you that are watching and listening, if you're able to take your Bibles and read along with us, please do. It has 25 verses, so you're going to share it between each other. <laughs> John chapter 21. It's on? Go ahead. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. Mm. After these things, Jesus wow. showed himself. himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. <laughs> Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Hmm. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Wow. Should they have known when he said that? <laughs> they should have, but they didn't. <laughs> so they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Mm -hmm. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish with you, which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Hmm. Jesus said to them, "Wow, come and eat breakfast <laughs> yet none of the disciples dared ask him who are you knowing that it was the lord jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish mm. this is now the third time jesus showed himself to his disciple after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than, more than these? He said to them, he, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Mm -hmm. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Mm -hmm. He said to him mm -hmm. the third time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved mm -hmm. because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Hmm. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed Eve. my sheep. Yes. Most assuredly, I say to you, when, we're, when you were young, when you were younger, you gird yourself and walk where you wish 
But when you are hold, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Wow. This he spoke signifying by what death hmm. he would glorify God. Wow. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Then Peter turned around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrayed you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would hmm. not die. <laughs> Yet Jesus did not say to him <laughs> that he would not die, but if I will that he mm -hmm. remain till I come, what is that to you? Mm. This is the disciple who testify of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world wow. itself could not contain the books wow. that would be written. Amen. 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 Bless you. Thank you. Isn't it beautiful to see a wife and husband reading the word together? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. The first verse and the first part of the verse says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples. He never showed himself to the world. He never showed himself to Pilate. He never showed himself to Herod. He never showed himself to anybody else but his disciples. And I pray that even in this room today, if you have had an encounter before, you will have it again. And if you have never had one before, I pray that this will be the day that the Lord will show himself to you. I pray so. It's good to be here and it's really good to see those of you that are here. We still have our brother from the island that is almost long, <laughs> from New York, Brother Sydney. Good to have you again, sir. And it, it, it's easy to remember his name. What do you equate his name with? Australia. Australia. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Sydney, Australia. Is that the capital? Because you hear a lot about Sydney, 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 Sydney. Hmm? It is an island. Yeah. But I'm wondering if, if, if Sydney is the capital or Melbourne. You're just guessing, okay? Yeah, we'll leave that to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have anyone visiting with us for the first time today? I think I, if I'm not mistaken, did I see Lee? That was here last week. Did, did, did you, you came back? For <laughs> Sister, Sister Jennifer said she came back for part two. <laughs> huh? That's what she said? Oh, wow. <laughs> Bless you. Good to have you back. 
We don't have anyone for the first time today, okay? I'm not missing anybody, right? Really good to be here, and it's good to see you all. And spring has finally sprung. <laughs> I clean snow twice. Um, Friday. Friday evening after we came in, I cleaned, and then Friday morning I had to go out again and clean. I said, is, I'm cleaning. I said, is this really spring? <laughs> <laughs> wow, but I'm not surprised because this winter has been a very strange, strange, I've been here now for over 14 years, steady, and I've never seen one like that. And the, the experts are saying that it's because of global warming, and they said that there's going to be many more to come and the government need to do something by 2030 because if we don't do something by 2030 we will never see winter again <laughs> that's not good that's not good <laughs> Oh my God, we need it. It's necessary. Even though you don't like it. Wow. I didn't even finish the statement. Yeah, amen. <laughs> but for us as the church, and, 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 and I mean, really, as the church who knows who the Lord Jesus Christ is and we believe in him, his words must be of more value to us than any other. He told us that there would be certain signs pointing to his return. And one of the signs Jesus said would happen, he said there would be sign in the sun and the moon and the stars. The sun and the moon and the stars affect weather. So the reason why we're having what they call global warming, it's because something is happening with the sun, and the moon, and the stars. Pay attention to it. Because it's for us to keep looking up. Not literally, you know, standing up, looking up with your, your you know, but be aware of the time that we're in. So, I want to remind you of um, what's coming up. Baptism on the, the 18th of um, May. Oh boy, it's coming up on us now. We planned it from January, but it's coming up. Not January or February, somewhere there. We have the baptismal forms that if you desire to do so, fill, fill it out. Just put it in the basket or give it to me or give it to somebody that you know will get it to me and we will take it from there. We have persons coming from the United States. We have persons coming from Jamaica. We have persons coming from Asia and uh, I'm going to put Australia on the, on the list too. We, 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 but God is just doing something amazing. And I, 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 I run out of adjectives to describe him. And of course you would because he's God. But he's just, wow. Now my, my favorite word nowadays is wow. You know, <laughs> wow. It's a wow moment. And then we have our family, uh, barbecue as we call it, coming up in July. God's willing, we will have our time together um, on the 27th, I think. Yep. You were at the last one? 
You weren't? Will you be here? That is what I'm saying. Hmm? Maybe not. Maybe not? Oh boy, and there is nothing that we can do to shift things around? Oh, you did one already? Yeah. Then what do you mean? If you need to and you want to, put it in. <laughs> Amen, right? Amen. Okay. There's another thing now that we have added to the announcements. Uh, a few weeks back, I got an invitation letter from Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some of you remember, I think it was in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 2016, Emmanuel was two years old. And um, they reach out. Um, they first, they were mentioning, they, they said that, you know, they were just mentioning because they know it was kind of a sudden, based on the time. They were mentioning the ending of March. But I said it would be too, you know. So they said, okay, we leave it to you. Give us your time. We will work with that. So we, I looked at it, thought about it, think about it, and stuff like that. And we decided to go the last weekend in the month of April. Because they want a weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But... There is some things that um, I need to say here. The daughter, one of the daughters, I should say, was the one who, she said, it came to her first, and she was thinking and praying on it. And then her mom said something to her, and she realized that, you know, she got a confirmation in that, and... She said, the reason why she's doing that, she remember when I came, she said she was on the verge of giving up on church. And when I came that weekend and preached on the kingdom of God, she said something shifted. They have a few young people that have come into the church now, and they said that they want to get them grounded so they decide to reach out to me. So what they want to do for the sat for the Friday and the Saturday night, it they want it to be a, a kind of a more intimate setting where it would be like a question and answer session. The young people have a lot of questions and they want me to sit down and just, you know, like Jesus and people sitting around his feet. So that settings would be a small setting. So if anybody is going to go with me for the Friday and the Saturday, we can't take a lot of people because I told them not to look for any bigger space, keep it in that small setting. And but the Sunday will be a bigger space, but still not big as Long Island is not long. Because <laughs> I think the space is what, 400? 400 persons. So if, if anyone from here desired to be there, especially I would invite you to be there for the Sunday morning, and they only have one service, Sunday morning service. I would think at least 30 persons we can accommodate. So if you desire to be a part of it and to be there, brush up on your French. <laughs> Bonjour. Comment ça va? Huh? Oui, ça va? <laughs> ah. Jim. Hold on there. Hold on there. Jim Appel. I am? Ah, I'm learning. So 
I want you to keep it in prayer. I am believing God for not just a mere, you know, church event and gathering. I'm believing God that when I go there, even after I leave, there must be a lingering. You know when someone walks into a room with strong cologne? And even after they leave, you're still smelling them? <laughs> there must be a lingering aroma that affects Montreal and affects Quebec. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep it in prayer, please, and you will get further information as we go along. And um, if it will be live stream, yes, we're going to bring our stuff with us because I won't be here for the Sunday. So, you know, all those people watching from all over. So we're going to live stream the Sunday morning, just the Sunday morning with live stream. The Friday and the Saturday evening would not be. Yep. If uh, taping it, I think so. That can be done. Yeah, that can be done. Yeah. So, I think that covers the announcement for today. We don't have anything else. No baby blessing. Nobody getting married? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, you, you need to share that. Please listen. There's a warning in my spirit. There's like an alarm. And the Lord is warning us to take heed. So even when I heard Sister... Um, Aisha say, listen to my son. Jesus was not able to do a lot of mighty miracles in a certain place because of unbelief. And he was with the people for three years. And God had to move him from place to place, but God removed him from that place. And the warning is, don't let God have to move pastor before we start to take this message serious and those that have been given for 14 years. When the Lord send warnings, one thing that you must understand it's because of the importance of what is being said. And secondly, the enemy is constantly at work for us to take things for granted, overlook things that we should really be focusing on. We become comfortable. We become, you know, and uh, I, I was sharing with someone a couple of days ago, and they asked me a certain question, and I reminded them of what is said in Hebrews chapter 2. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. That word there is in the Greek, the imagery that it gives you, it's when a boat is left on the sea without an anchor. What happens? And if you stand there watching it, 
it would appear that it's not moving. But over time, little by little, you see it's rocking and the current, and you would be surprised that within hours where that boat would end up. We ought to give the more, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them. And it feels like you're not drifting. It doesn't look like you're drifting. And that's how the enemy works, subtly. And so God will send these warnings to cause you to wake up and don't take things lightly. Don't take things for granted. Pay attention. Give yourself to what you need to give yourself to every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. My, my, my. Come, come here, come here, my dear. Charlene. Um, Leah. Come a little closer to me. Brianna? Justin and Jaden? Is Amos here? Come here. Shauna is here. Come here. Is this the last Sunday of the month of March? There's another one. Okay. So there's one more. Okay. Okay, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. There's something that has been in my spirit for the last um, couple of weeks. Um, I'll do it next Sunday. I won't, I won't say anything now, but I'll do it next Sunday. Um, I, I, sometimes I wish we have bigger space to, you know, but even if I didn't call you by name and not all of you are able to come down here, I don't want you to just sit there like you're in a theater. Participate. When Jesus was touched by the woman, the woman who touched the hem of his garment. If you notice the scripture, Jairus called Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Jesus was on his way. He wasn't going to the woman. Notice, he wasn't going to the woman. He was going to Jairus' house. But the woman heard that he was going to pass by. And she decided... That I don't, I don't care where he's going to go, who he's going to go with. I have a need. And I'm going to seize the moment. So don't just sit there and watch. Participate. Open yourself up to the Spirit. And know that the Spirit is in the room. And he knows you. He knows where you are. And even if you didn't get called down, doesn't mean that the Spirit doesn't know that you're here and you have a need. So open yourself. And like the woman, press. Press, press in, press in. 
Press in. Press in. Press in. Represents the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, Makasoto Robokunda, me, Mosoto. Oh, Spirit of the Living God, you are in this room. You know exactly what needs to be done. You know exactly what needs to be said. Father, thank you for your presence. Your presence is a healing presence. It's a delivering presence. It's a restoring presence. There is nothing that is too hard or difficult for you. So in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, I thank you for what your presence is doing right now in this room and what you will continue to do these lives. I bring them up under your rule. I bring them up under your authority. And I thank you. That there is no authority like yours. Your authority is matchless. Your authority is matchless. And Father, I thank you. In this moment, we receive authority. And we tread upon serpents and scorpions. And, up, oh, <laughs> and over all the power of the wicked one. And we believe that nothing shall by any means hurt us. You said it. It is written, it is done. It is done. It is done. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, without a shadow of a doubt, I know surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, I will dwell in his presence. I will dwell in his presence, in his presence, in your presence, in your presence, in your presence, in your presence. In your presence, in your presence, in your presence, in your presence. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with me, I will not go. If your presence does not go with me, I will not go. <laughs> In your presence. That's where I always want to be. In your presence. In your presence.
the dew in the morning. Let your presence rest upon us. We need your presence, Father, more than we need food. We need your presence more than we need food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In your presence, in your presence. In your presence. In your presence, in your presence, in your presence, Ooh. in your presence, in your presence, oh God, when you gave Jacob that dream. He said, this is a dreadful place, for the Lord is in this place. And I did not know. He took the rock, he poured the oil, he called it Bethel. Bethel, Bethel, house of God, house of God. Our bodies are the temple of the living God. Our bodies are the temple of the living God, the living God, the living God. Carry his presence, carry his presence, carry his presence. Carry his presence, carry his presence. Whew. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you. Mm. While the Holy Spirit continues to do whatever he's doing in this room right now, I want to just flow with the teaching that we have been looking at for the past couple of weeks, the divine principles of faith. As I mentioned earlier on about um, prior and how, because the church have stepped away from its identity in the first place, because in order for us to carry the authority and the power that is given to us within the kingdom, identity is important to, it, to that. If I don't know who I am, if I don't know who I am, I cannot be effective. If I don't know who I am, I cannot be effective. I 
And one of the attack, I would even dare say it is the main attack of the enemy, is to come against your identity. Because he knows that one's identity is corrupt, you lose your effectiveness. And many times when the enemy comes at us, if you find, if you, if you think back, you, what you find yourself doing is questioning your identity. Am I really saved? Am I really in God? Because when you're looking at the situation and certain feelings and certain things going through your mind, you start to question, and the moment you start to question your identity, it's an open door for Satan to now come and inject more lies and rob you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How does Satan steal? How does he kill, and how does he destroy? He can kill us. To the point where your body ceases to exist. But that's not, that's, that's not what he's really after. He kills you and yet your body is still functioning. The killing is a separation. How Satan kills you is to separate you. Have you ever... Have you ever thought about the statement that Jesus made in John chapter 8 that he was a murderer from the beginning? Satan. Jesus talking about Satan. And he said that he was a murderer from the beginning and does not abide in the truth. Satan, Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. You know what? Murder constitute right so if he's a murderer from the beginning who did he kill Cain was the first human murderer but he was not the first murderer Satan was who did he murder Think about it. Who did he murder? Adam. He separated Adam from God. And how did he do it? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How does he do it? How does he steal? How does he kill? How does he destroy? With lies. With lies. With lies. It was the identity of Adam that was attacked. We saw the first, first temptation that Jesus faced with the devil after he was baptized by John and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit led him into the wilderness. The devil said, no. And do, you, do you notice something? Do you notice something? That most most of Satan's conversation always starts with a question. He knows what he's doing. You know why he does it? Why does he always start most of his conversation with a question? Yes, is to put doubt in your mind, but there's something that he knows. When you're asked a question, your brain goes into a certain mode. That the only thing that your brain is doing at that moment is focusing on answering the question. It, it, it disconnects itself from everything else. And give everything to focus on that question. 
So when he came in the garden, he said to the woman, did God say, did God say, <laughs> did God say? And he trapped her. He came to do the same thing to Jesus. Remember how he started the conversation? If you are the son of God, if you are, if you are, if you are, if you are. And there are times when he come against us and say, if you were really of God, then this would not have happened. Or why is this happening if you really are of God? You start to question. You start to question your identity. But Jesus knew who he was. Because not only did he pose a question to engage him, he also gave him a challenge to do what? To prove himself. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. So if Jesus did Watch this. If Jesus responded to him to turn the stone into bread, what would it say on the part of Jesus? He did not believe what the Father had announced a few hours ago. If you notice, not too long after the Father announced, this is my beloved son, Satan, attack it. Notice, many times when you receive certain word from God, the attack intensifies for you to let it go, for you to give up, for you to pull back. Sometimes you even catch yourself saying, it's since I start to... Someone said to me even, you know, since you start to teach and faith... Some things have been happened that never happened before. You know why? Because there's something about this. And he doesn't want you to get it. Because he knows that I am going to tell you the truth. And if you get it, he's going to be in big trouble with you. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. These four scripture verses is saying this. The just shall live by faith. Who? The just shall live by faith. So if the just gives up on faith, what happens? Let me say what the four verses say again. The four, and it's four different. Because Habakkuk, the first time God's, God said it to Habakkuk, now it's written. That's where it's written. And in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writing to the believers in Rome and believers everywhere, for them to understand what has happened when the gospel of the kingdom is preached rightly, and you hear it and believe it, receive it, it brings you into something. It says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from Faith to faith, because it is written, the just shall live by faith. So if I give up on faith, am I still just? You know what the word just means, to be righteous. If I give up on faith in Christ, am I still the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? No. 
You're dead. So from faith to faith, it's about, continu it's about a continuation and sustenance. So your righteousness, which you receive from God as a gift through Christ, is you continue in it and it is sustained by faith. So this, this, this is not something to take lightly. This is something that I need to understand what it is. This is something that I need to know without a shadow of a doubt what it is, how it works. Do you have anything around you that you don't know what it is? It's there, but you don't know what it is. And as a result of that, it is not protected as it should. <laughs> there are certain things that should be happening to it, but it's not because you don't know what it is. There is no value or worth that is placed on it as, as it should. But when you know what the thing is, Faith has been corrupt, corrupted by the present state of what we call church. Just as how they corrupt prior, they corrupt everything else. Because many of the preachers that we see today, they are appealing to people's social needs. <laughs> Let me say that again. Many of the preachers that we see and hear, are here about today, they are appealing to people's social needs. That's why they do the things they do and say the things they say. So the gospel, the word gospel means good news. And what we have seen happen, and it started out in the United States, shortly after slavery was abolished by Abraham Lincoln in the United States. It started in the United States. There is a preacher that you go back into the history and you can see him. He's the one who first wrote a book. And that book affected especially what we call the evangelical or charismatic church in the United States of America. And they talk about social gospel. So the social gospel appeals to the human need. The social gospel is what gave birth to Martin Luther King. I said the social gospel is what gave birth to Martin Luther King. I used to think that Martin Luther King was really, you know, as they talk about a prophet. When I look back at certain things, I don't believe that Martin Luther King is a prophet. I don't believe even if God had really called him, he missed his calling when he got caught up in being a civil rights. Because when you, if you're called by God to be a pastor, preacher, or whatever, you don't, you don't have no business fighting for hear this. Do you understand one of the reasons why they crucified Jesus? Why? The people expect that Jesus came, what Jesus would have come to meet their social needs. You know, we thought, you remember after, even after the resurrection, there were two of the disciples on their way to Emmaus. And they had this conversation. And the Bible said, Jesus joined the conversation and they didn't know it was him. And Jesus said, what are you guys talking about? He said, oh, you're a stranger. You know, you, 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 have, you don't know what happened in, you know, three days ago, how Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And today is the third day. And we thought he would be, he would be, he would be the one to deliver Israel and to do this and do this. And, and Jesus said, oh, you fool and slow of heart to believe. Ought not the Christ, the, and the scripture said he opened, he opened their understanding and opened the scripture to them. 
They thought he was going to come, raise up a army, defeat the Romans, take back, you know, the kingdom of Israel and be a king. And that's one of the reasons why. Because many of you read it and many, 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 many times you, you think about it. Until some of you even ask me the question, why is it that Jesus on many occasions when he heals somebody, he would say to them, go and don't tell nobody. Don't tell anybody. You remember? In John chapter 6, he said, blessed they would come and force him to be a king. He came as a king, but not a king for your social needs. And the focus of the church today is on our social needs. I need this. I need a house. I need a car. I need this. I need a man. I need money. I need this. I need, I need, I need. My children need this. My this, my that. And all we're focusing on is what is corruption. Because listen, I'm not saying that you're not supposed to care for your children now. But in the end of the age you will not have any children you will not be married and you're not going to remember your mother that wasn't born again you're not going to remember your granny that wasn't born again that memory is going to be completely erased from you If God allowed that to happen, it would not be a state of perfection. So when the scripture says it's going to wipe away all tears, it's not the literal tears. It's going to wipe your memory. <laughs> because the reason why you cry, it's because... Why, why, why after your mama died how many years ago, you start, all of a sudden, you, you, <laughs> what a, oh, I remember, I remember mama. It's not the physical tears he's going to wipe away. He's going to wipe your memory clean. My wife will be there and I will not know her as wife and she will not know me as, and she will not even remember that we were married in this age. You remember what Jesus said? For in the age to come, they are like the angel spirits, neither married nor given to marriage. You still want to come? Because some of you say, oh, I, I, I passed that up, but I, I'm not sure if I will. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> All of this is temporary to tell an eternal story. Faith is not for us to have our social needs met. It's something, it, for, it, it is for something bigger than that. Because what we keep on missing, what we keep on missing is that God said, if you seek first, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all the social things that you have need of, you don't need faith for it. Hmm. That's where people have problem with me because see, I believe the Bible. I don't play with the Bible. You can't play with it. If you play with it, you're playing with life. God says to his son, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the social things that you have need of. I will simply had it. So now if you're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God, because he said, do not worry, don't worry. Do you, do you know that it takes a lot of energy for you to worry? I mean, uh, it takes a lot. It, it, it takes a lot of brain power. It takes a lot of emotion. It, worry, worry can age you in a day than how you would have been, you would have aged within a month or a year. 
Worry, it takes a lot. And God says, I will permit you to worry if. Anybody remember? God said, God said I don't have a problem with you worrying, but only on this condition if you can add one cubit to your lifespan. Then go ahead and worry. Because guess what? Hear what God is saying to you. That if you can do that, you would not worry. <laughs> because if you're able to add a lifespan to your life, why would you worry? He says, yes, hear this now. But I can. So trust me. Seek my rule first. Seek my reign first. Come to live under my rule. And all those things that Satan have been lying to you about and have you worrying about them. And one of the things that I learned really early into my walk with Christ. I did not learn it before because I was in darkness. I was thinking in darkness and making decisions in darkness. After I got born again, I began to look and I began to think about it. And I said, what's the use of worrying? Because when a situation arises and you sit down, say, 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 let us use the most common thing, money. Money. There's a, there's a need for money. And you sit down and you're worrying. Oh, God. And you go in your bed and you turn and you twist and you, you sit up and you do all, and you walk in the floor. Oh. When you wake up in the morning, if you slept... When you wake up in the morning, do you open the door and all of a sudden there is a bag full of money? If that was the case, I would be the biggest warrior. <laughs> I don't know. Mm, I don't think so. Mm -mm. Not where I am now in Christ. I wouldn't. No. Mm -mm. But what I'm trying to say, worry doesn't solve the problem. It makes it, because it begins to take a toll on your health. Because once you're not able to sleep properly, it begins to affect your, your health. Because your body needs to get a certain amount of sleep. Your body needs to get a certain amount of sleep. And when you're worrying, worry interrupts your sleep. It interrupts your eating pattern. Some people when they're worrying they don't eat. Some people when they're worrying they eat. They eat more. They're just eating, 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 eating. And then for some people, worry take them into a, a habit. And they become all fancy. And I remember when I asked this lady in Jamaica, why do you smoke? She said, oh, I know it's not good for me, but it just helped me to relax. <laughs> I came to Canada in the deep, 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 deep of winter. Minus feel like minus something, and 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 and, and you see somebody out there at, at the, and, and the wind is blowing and they're trying to they're, they're trying to, <sighs> and sometimes since I came I see some of them all they do is just take two draw and gone back in, <laughs> and then in about another fifteen minutes you see they come out again and <sighs> why is it that you don't smoke in your house? Yeah. Is that the reason why you don't... Uh, why is it I notice people don't smoke in the house? Why? It's illegal? Seriously? I did not... I was thinking other things. It's illegal for you to smoke in your house. <laughs> it's not? But Why? When we were living at Jessup, I saw this little old lady came out right at the little, you know, the, there's a corner house, and they said, and, and, and she's trying to light the cigarette. And, and I, I'm looking and I said, oh God. At one point, I wanted to go and help her. 
because she's struggling and she's not giving up and, and the, it's cold. And all of that is that it helps me to deal with my I remember the days when they used to advertise cigarette and they talk about mental Ooh. and there was Mataron and there was Cravenay. Cravenay, you know, that was the name. I think it's still in Jamaica. Cravenay with a with, I think it's a cat. They have a cat image on the, the pack of the cigarette. And they're they on there. Because the cigarette, the cigarette company, the tobacco company, wicked company, knows that this thing is not good for you. So they are protecting themselves. They have it written on the side of the box. Men, watch this, watch this. General surgeon suggest that smoking is hazard to your health. Do you read it? No, you don't. But they put it there that if you get to the point where your throat is we had a neighbor, many times I think he's going to die, and he never gives up. He's coughing until he's, you think he's going to pass out, and no, two minutes later. <laughs> the power of sin. The power of sin and the lies that the enemy tells the human that you need this in order for you to accomplish this. Some places is the wife and husband. You see two of them come out and smoking. I say, wow, wow. Worry doesn't fix anything. What did I say? <laughs> and if I tell you this, will you believe me? If I tell you something, will you believe me? Yes. Sure. Yes. Did you know that based on the word of God, worry is a sin? So why do we do it? If it is a sin and you know, why do we do it? So now notice how we're deceived that I will not do fornication. I will not catch myself doing adultery. I will not catch myself because, you know, these are big sin. But yet, for some of us, there is not a day past that we don't spend a little vacation time worrying and guess what we never repent we never repent of it we never even confess that we have sinned because we do not see it as sin but yet the scripture calls it a sin I see some of your face saying pastor show me Romans chapter 14 and verse 23. You know I don't say things for the sake of saying it. Romans chapter 14 and verse 23 says this. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When you are walking in faith, you do not worry. And that's the reason why God did not give you the spirit of what? Fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. 
to protect you from these things affecting your life. So if the just shall live by faith, the just does not worry. Let me say that again. If the just shall live by faith, it means that worry is not a part of a person that is just. The righteous, the person that is righteous, worry is not a part of their life. Because your faith puts you in a position and a place where worry is a part of your past life. All things are passed away. The whole thing has worry in it. And so when you say you don't worry, the, the, when I say I don't, people, what? I don't believe that. Nobody, nobody, nobody living in this world cannot say that and live like that. It's impossible. It's impossible. But remember, what is impossible with you? Is possible with God. So when I am with God, don't tell me that I can't live worry free. I am now 50 something. <laughs> right? They said it. They said it. And I recall from the time that I got born again. And um, the first time I had the experience, uh, I, I don't go to doctors, really. I don't, you know. And, but I remember the first time I had to do this was we would go to the dentist in Jamaica. So, you know, every six months to do our cleaning and stuff like that. And they would check your blood pressure before they do anything. And I remember the doctor, it was a, a Chinese doctor. Oh, I remember his name the other day. But, and it's not a hard, difficult name, but he, 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 they, 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 the, the lady was there doing, and he looked and he said, he said, are you always this calm? I said, as far as I know. And this happens after I got born again. I came to the place of understanding the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is also my Father. And when I put faith in Him, it delivers me from the previous life that I was a part of. In the kingdom of darkness, worry is a part of the culture. In the kingdom of darkness, fear is a part of the culture. In the kingdom of darkness, in the kingdom of darkness, everything that you see going on, sickness, disease, bondage, drugs, sex, and human trafficking, and child trafficking, and all the stuff that you see the world dealing with, and governments battling and, and struggling to control this, and, and the gun violence is getting worse in Canada, and the drugs, and, and as soon as they're trying to keep this drugs under control, all of a sudden one new something show up. And those of you that work even in the health system, you see certain things on a day-to-day -day basis that, wow, if you don't know God, it can, it, can, it can rip you apart. When you hear the, 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 the back story that goes on, that, that, that so many persons who work in the, the first responders area, they, they go through some trauma, there is post this and that, and many of them end up taking their lives. Because when they, when they get a call and they go on a scene and they see certain things, that thing, if you don't know God, it, 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 it takes a hold of your mind and, it, and, and it, 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 it imprisons you. They become alcoholic. They become drug addicts. But that, that world is not a part of the kingdom of God. Shh. Think. 
in this room, many of you are coming from a state, and some of us are still struggling with certain things, and we need to get this teaching. We need to get this teaching so that you completely destroy every remnant. But many of us are coming from a lifestyle where we were, I, I wouldn't say that we were, you know, casual drinkers. We were, the bottle was our friend. And the reason for that is, 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 to, is to help me to deal. Am, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I wrong? To deal with the pressures of life. So we drink, we drink certain things. And if you look at the world out there, they keep coming up. Every, every time you go into the store, I go into these, um, the, the, what you call the ones at the gas station? Convenience store, right? That's what you call it. And, and the amount of energy drink, Red Bull, Monster! Huh? Wow, imagine that! And, and what is it? People need certain boosts to keep them going. And guess what? It is not good for your health. But yet, it is legal. For them to sell it. And you go and you pay. You, you go to the country and say, give me a pack of that thing. Which one do you want? You know, and then just touch the thing and it just slide on. Boop and bam and ting ting. And you buy debt. And you're slowly committing suicide. Killing me. <laughs> somebody says softly, somebody says slowly. I, I don't know which one. <laughs> Let me take a few more minutes of your time and start something. Another part of this teaching. I give you a foretaste of it last week. And we went through this, and please don't forget this. Make sure you check yourself that you're not operating in positive thinking or positive speech because it, it's an enemy of faith in God. Number two, make sure you're not operating in blind faith because God doesn't do blind faith. God can be proven, right? Make sure you're not operating on a leap of faith, right? Number four, make sure that your feelings has nothing to do with what you say that you call faith. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the senses. Nothing to do with the senses. What you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you feel, nothing. It has nothing to do with faith. Nothing. It frightens, it, uh, uh, is that the right word I should use? It, 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 uh, what word should I use here? But it, 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 it bothers me, maybe that's a little more whatever, to see what we call church. And many of you in this room, you will even say, you will even say that I believe in God and I, I've been walking with God for long and I've been living for God and I'm a Christian and I got baptized and, I'm a, and, the, and I, I was a part of that church and that church and that church. And so I, I know God. But yet, we fail to live from a certain power from a certain power. I am not giving you gimmickry because it doesn't help. 
and, I, and I'm certainly not going to give you any frills. When I started reading the Bible, Sister Kim, and I got to, I tried starting at Genesis because I thought that's where you should start because that's the beginning, right? After I passed Genesis, Genesis and Exodus is, mm, it's kind of good, you know, you just read and you're reading and you're reading, man, and bam, and going on. But then, <laughs> When you are introduced to a guy named Lividicus, <laughs> he makes you livid and want to cuss. <laughs> Long chapters, repetition after repetition after repetition, and say, oh, God, I got it. And the names of the places and the persons made it even a little more difficult for you to enjoy reading it. I remember the time when I'd never enjoy reading Leviticus and Numbers. Never. And then First Chronicles. So it's chronicling the, the, the people starting from Adam and all these names. The first five chapters and this one begot this one. And if it was John begot Mary and Mary begot Jane and oh, Mephutolos Otala begot <laughs> Jehoshaphat. And all this. And, and, and you're there trying to pronounce the name and say, you know what? You just skip it and go over. And then I begin to understand that it's important to understand those names because as you read along, sometimes certain things that you've done there, it's connected to that individual. So if you jump over them, you reach down there and say, hmm, where, where did this come from? But I got to Judges. And when I started reading the book of Judges, after the death of Joshua, the judges ruled. And we got to this judge by the name of Samson. And many people believe with their carnal mind. We Im image, we have this image in our mind that Samson looks like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Am I right? Because even when you go to Sunday school, you know, Sunday school messes up. And the way how they teach things and do things and show you the imagery and stuff like that. I promise you, I promise you under God and don't fight me until we get there. Because I'm telling you, when we see Samson, you're going to be shocked. Well, at least you won't be shocked because God's not going to allow no shocking to take place there. But I promise you, Samson is no big muscle guy. Samson weren't working out. If you notice what the scripture says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. So what was the source of his strength? Because if he was like Hulk Hogan, the Philistines would not be wandering and scratching their head where his great strength lie. They would look at him and say, wow, it's because of his size and all of that. But they paid Delilah because when they come against this little wimpy looking guy, all of a sudden see chariots flying left, right and center, horses going deer, Philistines flying in the air, boom, bam, bam. That's a wall on there. Where does that <laughs> come from? And when Delilah began to question him, and he lied a couple of times, about maybe three or so times. And the thing, every time I hear it, and I said, I said, couldn't, is Samson not thinking? Every time he told Delilah, Delilah, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. The Bible said the Philistines were there waiting. And then she started crying. She said, you have lied to me. I thought you said you love me. He says, okay, this is it. I have been a Nazarite from the womb. No razor has ever touched my hair because it's a sign of my sanctification, my consecration. He said, the day this is cut off, 
I, no, listen, I am as weak as any other man. So when the Spirit of God is in you, you are not like any other man. I want somebody to hear that and stop let religion rob you. When the Spirit of God is in you, you are not like any other man. Notice, notice what I said. The Spirit of the living God. And the Bible even says, your body is the temple of the living God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which God gave you. So the Spirit of God in you allow you to deal with stress differently from the world. That I don't need to smoke to deal with my stress. I don't need to drink to deal with my stress. I don't need to binge eat to deal with my stress. I don't need to lock away in a dark room to deal with my strength. My God, I allow the Spirit of God... I want to show you something. The Bible said the moment he said that to her, because everything she told him, she tried it. She got his hair cut off. I think it's what, seven locks? She cut it off. And the Bible said when they did that, and she said, Samson, the Philistines. And the Bible said he got up like other times. And said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shake myself. The Bible said he did not know that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. So what was the source of his strength? The spirit of the Lord. My God, we, we, are, we are underestimating the Holy Spirit. Whew. Sometimes I literally believe I am dreaming the state that my life is in. It's, it's like a dream, but it's not. It's real. Because when you're born again, the Spirit of God takes up residence. In you, he doesn't visit you prosper. He and Jesus said he's gonna dwell in you for how long? Forever, and he's going to be with you forever. Because remember, when did the Holy Spirit depart from man? After man sinned, God says, Because he has also become flesh, my spirit cannot dwell in him forever. So when the second Adam, the last Adam came and redeemed us, the Holy Spirit comes to live again in us, not visiting us, but abiding in us forever. So whatever pressure Satan wants to show up with, oh my God, there is no pressure that you and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sustain you under pressure, that you're under pressure and you look like you don't have any pressure, and you're behaving like there is no pressure, that when you talk about some things you're going through, people believe that you are lying. Because when Jesus said this in John chapter 14, and I think verse 27, he says, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Who you think is the enforcer of that peace? The Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Peace is the third in the list. So the Holy Spirit is the one that now comes to activate that peace in your life. And that peace is about strength. 
That peace is not about the absence of war. That peace means, watch this, you're in war, but you're sleeping as if there is no war. Because we noticed that peace. When Jesus was operating in that peace, he went in the bottom of the boat. He fell asleep. The storm, the... Peter, 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 Peter had to go and wake. Peter had to go and wake him up. That peace allows you to give you the ability to sleep in the storm without any NyQuil or DayQuil. You don't need the head of no sleeping pill when you know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit gives you sweet sleep in the midst of the storm. Though my ship may be rocking and my sail may be torn, I shall rest where? In the high. I have peace. He gave it, he left it with me and he gave it to me. He didn't leave it for me to keep it safe until he comes back. He says, I leave it with you and I gave it to you. So if he leave it with you and give it to you, what are you supposed to do? And it's a peace that passes all human understanding. You can't explain it, but you know you have it. You, you notice some of you, you, you find yourself that the moment you start to really receive the kingdom message, you realize that some things that used to even bother you, they don't bother you no more. Certain things that you used to be overly concerned about, all of a sudden you just, uh, take it easy, take it easy, no need to worry. Yeah. <laughs> And the devil, the devil are getting mad and I say, come on, you're supposed to be worrying. You're supposed to be crying. You're supposed to be complaining. You're supposed to be beating up yourself and you're taking it easy. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. He says, come unto me. Come unto me. Come unto me. Come unto me. Who? 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 All you who are labored and are heavy laden. And what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you shall find rest unto your soul. Why? For my yoke is easy and my burden, that doesn't make no sense. The word of God has nothing to do with your sense but faith. Because in the natural, you know so where sense is concerned, burden cannot be light. Burden, the very word burden. But he says, my yoke is easy. So you're going to yoke yourself up with him. The, the, the concept of yoke, the concept of yoke. Have you ever seen a yoke? Yoke, you know, you yoke up two animals, two oxen, two donkeys and stuff like that. So now Jesus says, take my yoke. So it means you're going to be yoked up with him. So wherever Jesus is. You are. Wherever Jesus goes, you go. Whatever Jesus have, you have. <laughs> and he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Easy. That scripture changes everything for me. When I apply it to every area of my life, even where my marriage is concerned, it's just naturally, easily, just flowing and just happening exactly the way God wants it. And there are those of us who think that marriage is a prison. Well, it's the wrong... <laughs> <laughs> is, is, the, is the wrong is the wrong marriage you're in 
It's the wrong marriage you have. That marriage doesn't come from God. Hear what the scripture says in Proverbs. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. The good thing is not the woman. It's not the wife. The good thing is the marriage. Finds a good thing and, and hear this, and obtain favor from the Lord. And the scripture said, now live joyful with the wife of your youth. Let her breasts, whether the breasts big or the breasts small or the breasts tiny, it's a let her breasts satisfy you. That's the word, sister. And he said, he said, he said, he said, don't, he said, don't go around and drink out of everybody's fountain. Let, let your own fountain. Oh. <laughs> For some of us, our marriage, the fountain dry up. Not even sun in there. But what God has constituted, instituted, and give to you, God does not give you anything that brings burden with it. The blessings of the Lord, it makes rich, and he has no sorrow with it. Talking about faith. Touch a person beside you and say, neighbor, according to the word of God, not according to my word, according to the word of the living God, if you are born again, if you are born again, the spirit of God dwells in you. And if the spirit of God dwells in you, you are not normal. Now open your mouth and say, I am, I am not normal. I am not normal. I am not normal. I am not normal. Woo, woo. My God, my God. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter three and chapter four. You put both of them together, and it says, "We, we, 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 we have a treasure. We have a treasure, and you know where the treasure is? It's in earthen vessel. And because of this treasure that is in this earthen vessel, oh my God, there is a glory. There is a glory that we are looking into." And he says, as we gaze into this glory, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And he said, while the outer man perish, yet the inner man is renewed. When? Day by day. Day by day. Your spirit right now is not where you were yesterday. Let me say that again. Your spirit right now is not where you were yesterday. The inner man, the inner man is renewed day by day. And we live from the inner man. That's why faith is important. 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 Because the just shall live by faith. It's by faith you make the withdrawals day by day. Your circumstances has nothing to do with who you are now. Now, 
your circumstances has nothing to do with who you are now. And in the world, if you're addicted to something, they labeled you according to your addiction. And they say, in the world out there, they say, once an addict, that's a lie. That's a lie. Oh, Paul say, Paul say, now you have been washed. Oh, you have been sanctified. He says, such were some of you. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. But now you have been washed. You have been sanctified. Oh, my God. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a son of God. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am. <laughs> That's no joke. That's no gimmickry. That's the truth. That's freedom. That's life in Christ. We have a treasure. And when you go over into chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, it's said because of that treasure. Oh, cast down but not forsaken. My God Almighty, all kinds of things coming against you. But it doesn't matter what is coming against you. You're still, you're, you're still standing. You're above you. Oh, ho, 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 ho. And you know what the scripture call? The things that comes against you. He said, this light affliction. What? This light affliction is working for us a far more weight of eternal glory. Watch this. While we look not at the things that are seen. And that's where the enemy trick us. He have us looking at everything going on around us. And, and when you keep on looking at it, you magnify it. He said, while we look not at the things that are seen, for the things that are seen is temporal. But the things that are not seen, they are eternal. So God has now given you faith to see things that are not. Hear this. Faith gives you the ability to see things that cannot be seen. Amen. Let me say it again. Faith in God gives you the ability to see things that cannot be seen. Are you getting it? So the things that cannot be seen is your natural eyes, your natural sight. So there are things that your natural sight cannot see. Because, because... Because as it is written, eyes, natural eyes have not seen, natural ears have not heard, neither have it entered into the natural mind, the natural heart, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God in you, reveal those things unto us. And God, watch this, what spirit knows the things of man but the spirit of man that is in man? What spirit knows the things of God but the spirit of God? Therefore, God did not give us the spirit of the world, but he gave us his spirit. And the spirit of God searches the... You can't be getting deep things and live normal. You can't be getting deep things and stay on the shallow. Come on, I'm here to pull you. I'm here to pull you deep. I'm here to pull you into the deep. Deep water fish has certain abilities that the shallow water fish doesn't have. Deep water fish has bioluminescence. It's the ability to produce their own light. 
Because in that deep, the sunlight does not shine. So in order for them to have any light, God gives them the ability to produce their own light. <laughs> Woo! And those kind, listen to me, those kind of fish, they're not easily caught. And today, they don't have the kind of equipment to even manage that depth. Because the deeper you go, the pressure of the water is lit. You remember this some time ago, was it last year? This scientist and his crew, they built this thing and they died. And, and when they were talking to the guy who produced the Avatar movie, because he himself is a scientist too. He said, I, he said, I wasn't surprised when I heard the news. He said, because that thing was not tested and even passed the test for them to go that deep. Because he said, the moment you start to go that deep and the pressure of the water, hear me today. God say, I have given you the ability to go deep. unto deep and come the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God search the deep things of God and make it known unto you so once you receive what the Spirit search deep and give to you and you receive it you can't stay shallow can I say this to somebody in this room. I don't care what's going on around you. I don't care who. I don't care what. For God's sake, do not go back into the shallow. Stay in the deep. Help me talk to somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, stay in the deep. Trisha, stay in the deep. Brother Patrick. Even when they don't understand you. Even when they're criticizing you. Even if you're alone. Because sometimes when you're out there in the deep, you feel alone, but you're not lonely. Stay in the deep. Stay in the deep. That's where you are called to live. Wives. Wives, you love your husband. You ought to. But listen to me. If your husband starts to get shallow and going back into shallow, for heaven's sake, do not go with your husband. Stay in the deep. Stay in the deep. And listen to me. Sometimes in order for him to even come back to the deep, you need, you need to stay out there. No, go with him. And husbands, you love your wife, and you ought. But if your wife is pulling back into the shallow, do not let her. You notice? Lot wife looked back, but Lot did not. So not because somebody did it or is doing it, you have to do it. No, stay in the deep. One more time, slap somebody and say to them, I am saying to you one more time, stay in the deep. When you're in the deep, sit and have a hard time to find you. When you're in the deep, demons struggle to find you. When you're in the shallow, you're easily spotted. But when you're in the deep. Yes. Stay in the deep, stay in the deep, stay in the deep. Stay in the deep, stay in the deep, stay in the deep. God, can I touch this to the Lord? Can I? It 
it's one foundation. It's one foundation. But, 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 I divide it into two for you to see what is supposed to be a part of the foundation of your faith. It's, let me say it again. It's one foundation, but I divided it into two for you to see clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, what is supposed to be a part of the foundation of your faith. I watched the church for over 30 odd years now. And I recall I have gone to so many places to minister the word of God. And one of the prayer that many persons would come to me and ask me to pray for. One of the things that many persons came to me asking me to pray for is, guess what? Faith. I said, Pastor, I need more faith. Pastor, this is happening and this is happening and, and I need more faith. And I said, it doesn't work like that. I can pray for you. I can pray for you. And there is an impartation that eventually will put you in a position for you to receive. For you to receive. And the question is, how do you receive faith? How do you receive faith? There is the initial, there is the initial giving of faith when you come to faith in Christ for the first time. Right? And then after you're born again, that faith needs to be sustained and it needs to be developed, which is you developing in it. What is it that God put in place? Remember, we're dealing with the divine principles of faith. We are at a juncture in time, and there are those of us that even where your life is concerned, we're at a place in our life that this is a time that we cannot afford to play around we cannot afford to miss the mark anymore. We need to become accurate marks, men, if I may use that term. That you don't, you, you're not missing. When, when, when you fire, when you, when you shoot, when you, when you do what you do, you're hitting, you're always hitting the mark. And that's God's will. My little children, John, 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. Hmm. Notice. So whatever he's writing from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. We need to get that. That it's possible for me to get to that place in Christ that I do not sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Romans chapter 6. That grace may abound. God forbid. For how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You notice, the, you notice the imagery, the concept, the idea that it gives you? Dead. You know that when someone is dead. Some of us have family member that is dead. When last have you gone into the kitchen and see them preparing a meal? When last have you bucked them up in the grocery store shopping? And they say, oh, you know, we run out of food down there, you know, so I come up to get some food and I'll see you sometime. They don't. Once they are dead, they're dead to this world. They're dead to this life. It doesn't matter what they were addicted to. They're no longer addicted to it. They're dead. So the scripture use that concept for you to grasp it. That when I am born again and I come to faith in Christ, there is a death that takes place. And I am now made alive. You who were dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Has he made alive with Christ. And you are seated with Christ in heavenly places.
Number one, the foundation, the foundation of our faith is supposed to be belief in God for who he is. Number two, belief in the And I'm not telling you that because the name of the ministry is Kingdom Living Ministries now. I'm going to show you. But before I show you, I want to remind you. I showed you this last week. That's foundation. Do you use it, Sister Rose? You do? Yeah. I've never used it. I... I <laughs> 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 I did? I beg your pardon, brother, brother. She said, no, no, you did. When we're doing the kale, kale and um, table talk. Trisha, you never told me that you gave me foundation. <laughs> they, they made us up. We had to put on makeup to go there. So, you know, whatever. And then after we cut, they would come and they would do, I never knew I was, oh, so that's why my face was so heavy sometime. <laughs> <laughs> foundation. We know that foundations, we know that foundations are very, very important. One of the things that I notice in life, when we talk about a structure, when we talk about an edifice, a building, and there's so many unique buildings, even in Mississauga here. Oh, it's on the other side? The Merlin Monroe building. It, it, it's, it's uniquely shaped out. But the most important thing about that building is not the Merlin Monroe that you can see. It's what you can see. And in order for them to have a structure that high, they have to have a foundation that is deep. Jesus says, whoever hears these saying of mine, in Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 6, he says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and do them, he says, I will liken him unto a man who dig, who dig a deep foundation and builds upon that. He said, but the one who hears these sayings of mine and did not do it, I will liken him to a man who builds his house upon the sun. And both on the rock, on the sun, the same elements come at you. The wind blow, the rain descend, and all of these things is happening. And he said, the one that is built on the rock, it remains standing. But the one that is built on the sun, and we know, you have been to the beach, you have been to the whatever. We have, you remember we built those sun castles? What happened as soon as the wave comes in, and we are crying. <laughs> it's gone. That's the life that does not walk in faithfulness to God. Foundation, it's covered up. We never discuss it, but it's important. Look at another one. Depends on what you, you want to build. The designs are different. And this is a foundation. Notice that. You notice that tree? That tree is not easily rooted up. Wow. It has years of sending down root and sending out. And even during the winter, when you see the upper part of the tree, you know, the leaves off. During the winter, it's still doing something, but it's not doing anything upward. It's doing it downward, preparing itself for spring. The scripture says in Psalm 90 that the righteous will be like a, no, listen, a palm tree in the house of the Lord. Wow. Palm tree, I've seen them, in Jamaica, they have them in certain areas, certain places, even in certain towns, they have them lining the streets and they grow real tall. They said as tall as you see the palm tree, that's how deep the root is. 
you never see them root up during an hurricane. It will break, but never root up. <laughs> so when, when, when God uses certain things to describe us, you need to stop and think about it because God not pick chaka chaka things to describe you. You notice God doesn't use chicken to say those who wait upon the Lord shall mount up like a chicken. <laughs> no, 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 no. Chicken make a lot of noise. They can't fly for too long. They take off. And all went down. <laughs> the eagle, they take off and they do a couple flops. And that is to take them to a certain altitude. And the moment they get to the altitude, the eagle is built Design. That's where they get the idea with the plane wings. Once it gets to the altitude, it locks its wing. And the wind, it's just soaring. So those who trust in the Lord shall be, you see, like that eagle mounting up with wings. Hallelujah. The young men run, but they get weary. They faint along the way. This tree... You look at the foundation, and then there is this kind of foundation. <laughs> now, if your foundation is like that, <laughs> foundation, I use a band aid. This is what's happening in a lot of our churches, our congregation. God's people are falling apart, and they go to church on a Sunday morning, and the pastor is giving them a Band-Aid. They go through the week and they're coming back next week for another Band-Aid. Band-Aid can't fix that crack. <laughs> A crack like this, if you're going to fix it, how would it be fixed? Hmm? Yep, you can fill it. But filling it doesn't fix it. It's, 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 a, it's a cosmetic thing, fix. In order for you to fix it, they need to dig out. Dig out. Ah. God does not fix anything like this. We are introduced to a bandaid church. Bonded microwave church, and we see the lives really putting it on display. Quick fix. A lot of them could not handle me. They could not handle my teaching because they are the 15 minute. That's why Joel Osteen give a lot of jokes. They give a, they sing a lot. They, they sing like for all a hour and a half, two hours, and a 15 minutes new age philosophy. Middle Eastern, throw in one liquor verse of scripture, sprinkle. And we go, we see the results. Not with me. So let us go back to this. Let me show you two scriptures and I'll stop and we pick up on it for next week. The first one is Hebrews chapter 6. Your faith has a foundation. And if the foundation is faulty, your faith will fall apart. Many of us for years, we think that we need more faith. And the reason why we're thinking that we need more faith is because the foundation is faulty. From day one, the foundation has been faulty. And I'm going to show you something, and I don't know if you will receive it. But where the danger lies here in what I'm going to show you is that after I showed it to you, that I'm going to show you the truth, and you hear it and you see it, if you refuse, if you refuse to receive it and comply yourself to it, you will suffer the consequences. And the consequences will definitely be that of disobedience. In Isaiah chapter 1, 
God said to Israel through Isaiah, he said, if you will be, if he, he said, if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you rebel and refuse, you will be devoured with the sword, saith the Lord. Now, I want us to understand why I say this from time to time. It is better for you not to hear me than to hear me and did not receive what you heard. God released a warning this morning. Aisha was saying something. Trisha came and confirmed something further. Do not take this thing lightly. We're at a juncture where we need to get it. Yesterday evening, um, I got a, 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 a voice note from a sister in, in, um, in Trinidad. Sister Joan. Joan. She sent and asked me a message earlier on in the week. And I responded to her. And when I listened to the message, oh my goodness. She said, Pastor, I am so glad that I'm alive now. I am glad that God kept me and I didn't. Because she said, the truth that I am now learning. Can you imagine if I had died and didn't get it? She said, Pastor, from I start watching your channel, she said, my life has changed completely. And I think it's um, brother Mike, Mike, Michael Wayne, the, the Wayne family, I think they're the ones who know her. They're the ones who made the connection. She said, Pastor, she, you know what you call me? She said, my teacher. <laughs> hmm? So listen to me now. I'm going to show you something that is integral to faith. That we were never told when we came to give our life to the Lord. Because they call you down to the altar and they said, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I confess my sins. And you didn't, which was a big lie, right? That's all. You are come to Jesus and you are a liar. Come to him. Because <laughs> they didn't even give you no time to confess your sins. And if you need time to confess your sin, it couldn't happen there, sir. You're 45 years old. And you, you, need to, you need to confess your sins? Whew. That's going to take a while. You say, hold on, preacher. Give me some time. I'll come back. I don't know when, but if you say I'm supposed to confess my sins, because it's a lot. But God, nowhere in the scripture, God required the sinners to confess their sins. <laughs> Find it, and I will correct what I just said. I will never correct what I just said, because you will never find it. Nowhere in the scripture God requires the sinner to confess their sins to come to Christ. What does God? God does require a confession, but it's not confession of sins. It, watch this. It shall come to pass that whosoever confess, right? If you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Not confessing your sins. Not confess. So it says, with the heart man believe, and with the mouth confession is made unto what? salvation, righteousness. So when you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, God forgives you of all the 45 years of sin. In a moment. Because even if you were supposed to confess it, you notice it's many, many years roll over and you remember, oh my God, I can't believe that I used to do something like that. Sometimes when you remember some of the things that you used to do, it sicks you. So, wow, I was a part of that. Thank God it doesn't require that I confess everything. Confess only his son and he forgives me. Hebrews chapter 6, it says this. Therefore, laying the, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, take note the elementary principles do you know how many persons are in the body of Christ today and never get these kind of teaching? They know nothing about the elementary principles of Christ. Even in the last fasting meeting, the Lord had me touching. I'm, I wasn't teaching on it. I just passed by. Just tap and pass by. And tithe. After that meeting, many persons even came and they said, Pastor, I never know that tithing still continue because there are those who, the objection to it is that tithe is of the law which that is a lie. 
tide is over, since the law is over. And so many of us, we don't do it any at all. And for those who do it, we give what we feel like giving. Because a sister even said to me, she said, Pastor, I thought, you know, you give as, you, as the Lord prosper. I said, no, that's different. That's not dealing with tithes. That's dealing with offering, if you read the scripture in context. The tithe, the very word tithe means tent. And God require that of you for certain reasons to put you in something which I'm not going to talk about now and none of you ask me about it after the meeting either because I shall not thou tell us thou <laughs> wait until later on down the road because now I realize I need to really do a teaching on it and a brother said pastor why don't you I said brother it's because of this, but pastor, if this is whatever, it doesn't matter what people want to say. Because these are things, I shy away from anything that has to do with money for years now. Because I don't want people to ever think that I'm in this for the money. But where truth is concerned, we need to understand. And what I'm saying with this, tithing is an elementary principle. Yet, many of us, there is a conflict when you touch it, it creates a lot of thinking, a lot of emotion. It leaves a lot of different tastes in people's mouth because it has been abused in the church. And because of that, we shy away. And those of us, as I said, who say we're giving tithes, we're either lying or we're disobedience. Or we're in control of what we give to God. And we need to understand why tide could not have ended when the law ended because of what it represents. I say, I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs> but it's, it's an elementary principle. So when we argue about it, it's, it's clear indication that we don't understand the elementary. But yet we're in college, we're in university. If you did not get the elementary and you're in college and university, and when the professor puts certain things on the board, and you have to be 10, <laughs> are you, you, you um, A is for apple, ah, ah, ah. By the time you finish, go through the alphabet, the professor, bell ring, and it's class over. By the time you get to college, you should have already mastered the elementary and the elementary continue to be important to your foundation. So this is what the scripture is saying. Therefore, leaving, it didn't say abandoning. The leaving here is a growing up, is a maturity taking place. It said, therefore, leaving the elementary, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to university and not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and notice the next statement and of faith toward God. What does that mean? I know that I can't go any further with this, all right? Let's, let me show you something. Quickly go to chapter 11. And when I come back next week, I'm going to have to come back here. And I need to show you the framework of what this really established for you and I to build our faith around. You see clearly, it says, the elementary principles of repentance from Dead works, and the second one, there is six elementary principles that is listed in that, in that passage. And the second one is faith towards God. And when we do not understand the repentance from dead works, many of us struggle with certain things, and it's that which Satan is using against us. Dead works is when we were away from God. We didn't know God. We were in darkness. We think in darkness. We made decisions in darkness. When God saved us, he took us out of the kingdom, out of the power. He delivered us from the power of darkness. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And he translated us and placed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. 
So we're no longer making decisions in darkness. We're now making decisions in light. Because the kingdom of God is also a, king, a kingdom of light. So now, what Satan does from time to time, because if you notice, what Satan uses to oppress you is not things concerning your... Is things concerning your... What depress you many times when we get depressed? When we get depressed? What, what, what is the depression all about? Isn't it something that you are reminded of? Something that you didn't accomplish? Something that you didn't do? Something that didn't happen for you? Something that, whatever. And, and, and all of a sudden, you get into this mode. You get into this state. And he said, look. I'm 50... I wanted to have a baby, and I didn't. And you can still have a baby if you're, if you're 50, because they can juke something and, it's, you know, and stab you and, and, and something happen. But why are you going to be sit down and depressed because you didn't have a baby, and everybody around you having baby? Is your destiny in time to have baby or babies? But pastor... I want to feel the joys of having a baby. You really do? <laughs> you really do. <laughs> I, heard, I heard a preacher many, many years ago when I was in Jamaica. I said, you say when people, when they have the first baby, they can't keep their hands off it. They everywhere, you know, the baby. But the second one, they leave the baby in the parking lot on the car. They get in and say, where, where is the baby? <laughs> because after the first one, <laughs> and you experience certain things, I don't know how true that is, but your destiny in time is not to have children. So if you didn't have any, and you're in Christ, depressed about what? Another thing that depresses, especially uh, ladies, ladies. You had some lady stuff yesterday. I heard that it was good. None of you invited me. None, not one of them. <laughs> but I heard it was good. And listen to me, another thing that I find depress a lot of women, some of you looking at me right now, is... Oil? <laughs> I never take it off. It has been there for over 14 years. No hair grow there. <laughs> From the time I said I do, look at it. It, 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 have, a, it have the shape of my finger. Because I'll when me slam the... F <laughs> a lot of you are depressed. Because you got married, the marriage didn't work. Some of you don't get married yet, and you want to get married. I'm getting married in the morning. Ding, dang, ding, dang, 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 dang. And then when you're invited to go to a wedding, all of a sudden, the blues. My baby is gone. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you ever wonder where God get me from sometimes? <laughs> Can I help you? Can I help you? A sister here sent me a message. She sent a question to me. And I thought about the question when she sent it. You know, I look at it first time and then I responded after a while. And the question she sent is to ask me, what does it mean in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus says, some were born eunuchs, some were made eunuchs by men, and some made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake? While marriage is the will of God, not all of us will get married. 
And if you force it, that's when it becomes prison. It's going to talk to you like the donkey talked to Balaam. We need to understand your destiny is not to get married. <coughs> what, pastor? You mean? <laughs> I know some of you have already made the list of the man that you want. And you keep looking. And you're ticking off and you're ticking off. And one of the disappointments that will come, you will never be able to tick off all the things that you want in the man. Because that man does not exist. Unless you go into a laboratory and form him. And the ladies that some of us are looking for does not exist. Because you see, even in the book of Proverbs, and we forget that the book is called Proverbs. We read in the book of Proverbs and we read about this woman. And that woman doesn't really exist. The woman wake up early, gone a bush, get stuff. She go, she do things with her hand and she make court for her husband. And all her husband does is to sit in the gates <laughs> of the city. Which part of the woman did they? Hey! It's a Proverbs. It's a Proverbs. So now, some of us are looking for that woman. You will never find her. Because God is going to give you a woman where you, by the grace of God, have to let the grace of God through you help to mold her. You see, you see, you see my wife? That's not who she was when I and I made, meet her. And even when I and I say, I do, you think that's who she was? Talk to her. But over the years, being married to a godly man, a man that is settled in Christ, she was able to shed some things and come in. Because God is not going to give you a woman that is complete. Mm -hmm. If he does, how are you going to exercise and experience Christ loving the church? There has to be some things. And because you love her, she's able to come in. Because I, I heard my wife, I heard her telling somebody, she said, there was so many things, but she said, because of the love that my husband gave to me, it allows me to come into certain things. Because of the love that Christ lavish on us, it allows us to change. It allows us to repent. It allows us to grow. And so God wants to display that through the husband. So there's going to be some things in the wife's life, especially the wife. Because if the husband is not mature and certain things start happening in my wife, what am I going to do? Go and take up that spot cover. <laughs> but when, you, when you're mature enough, and in spite of what your wife is doing or certain things that is happening, you behave yourself like Uzziah. And even when God said, go and buy her again and marry her again and take her again, and she go back, he said, go and take her because this is the love that I have for Israel. That even though she has gone astray, I will marry her again. Hmm? But your destiny is not to marry. Your destiny is not to have children. 
Your destiny is not to make money. <laughs> your destiny, your destiny, your destiny is not to accumulate things. Am I making it up? Why was Jesus never married? And Jesus now have no son and he have no daughter. There is nobody anywhere. There is nobody in Israel that I am the son. I am the daughter of Jesus of Nazareth. Never had a child. Yet he was a male with everything functioning as a male. He had a penis. Because he was, a, he was in a, Christ was in a male body. And Jesus had a penis. And his sexual desires was alive and well. Why? Hebrews chapter 4. He was tempted in all points. In what points are we? Notice the points where Satan. <laughs> Notice the points. We are tempted sexually. As long as you engine a turnover. <laughs> even, if look, even if the piston rusty, it's still a turnover. And, and he must show you things and he must suggest things to you. And even if things can't even turn over right and stand up straight, but it's still... <laughs> as long as you're alive, he's going to tempt you. Thoughts are going to come to your mind. But when you understand that this is not my destiny, I am not going to give in to this. I am not going to give in. I am not going to let it discourage me because I'm not married. I'm going to come with a nonsense. Why is it that so many black women are not married and you want to hang on to that garbage? There is a lot of white women that are not married it's a sin of the world because family is under attack left right and center but we just target everything black black why so much this among black and i'm not saying that some of these things are not true but it's nonsense especially after you're born again you don't hang on upon that black train i do not celebrate black history month you notice I don't mention anything about it when it comes. We will not put on a special program because we're not here to celebrate Black History Month. It's nonsense. Every year we go, then give it one whole month, we go dig up back and oh, because of Gone back to dig up Malcolm X and dig up Martin Luther King and dig up Nanny and dig up Paul Bogle and dig up and dig up and dig up and dig up. We are in Christ. And when we're in Christ, there is neither Jew, there is neither Greek, there is neither black, there is neither white, there is neither male nor female. Our destiny surpassed being black. The black people are so desperate, we go to the Bible and we are looking for who black. Because they said it's a white man book, so we go say, hey, black people in the Bible, too, you know. We you have got a Bible and look for black people. <laughs> oh, in the book of Song of Solomon, oh, he says, I am black and comely. <laughs> eh, eh. Did you read the previous verse before he said, I was black and comely? Why he says that? And it's not Solomon that was saying it. So don't make people fool. That's why you need to read the Bible. It was not Solomon that was saying it. Remember? The story is that there is these two persons that is so deeply in love that they cannot keep their hands off each other and they cannot afford to ever be apart. So you notice, she says, have you seen my lover? You know, he's out in the street. And, and they say, oh, you know, why are you going on like that? What is so special about your beloved that you're not? Another? And so, oh, my beloved, oh, his hair is like this, his teeth is like this, his eyes are like this, da 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 da. And she said, I am black and comely, black and tan. Why? Because of the sun. Because of the sun. 
they are places like what we, this, what, what we call church, and they're literally presenting a black Jesus. Because they say, for too long we have been told that Jesus is white. You think that I come to Jesus because of pigmentation? You think that God sent Jesus Christ into this world for pigmentation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoso, whoso, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. I'm sorry. I was supposed to be taking you, taking you to where? Hebrews 11 and stop. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're, we're taping this so you can go back and, 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 and re-listen and re-watch and get more, get more, get more. Now, when I come back next week, um, as I said, I want to pick up at Hebrews chapter 6 because we need to establish what it means when it says faith towards God. Faith towards God. That's important. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to skip over the verses and come to verse 6. And we read this, we quote it, we read, we quote. But what does it mean? It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who is him here? Because in verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found. So that means somebody went looking for him because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had his testimony that he did what? So verse 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, God, for he who comes to God look, look, at that, look at the part that we're missing here must believe that he that two letter little word right in there so changes the whole picture that he is, is what hold on hold on hold on, hold on, hold on. Not that he is God, because that believe that he God is. It's not believe that he is God. Believe that he God is. Watch this. And, and that he God is our... So it's he God, what you believe that he is is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And I'm going to stop there. Sister Lee, you're going to have to come back for part three. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. And I want you to think on it. Because we, we have quoted that verse for years. We have heard preachers, preachers after preachers. Every preacher that talk about faith, they go to that verse. But yet we're missing the main ingredient for he who comes to God must believe that he is. I've heard some person say, oh, the is is that we believe that he exists. Nonsense. It's not, it's not believed that he exists. He exists as what? That's why our faith is so shaky. Because what is supposed to be the foundation, the foundation, it's not in place. That tree can stand up against some hurricane. I mean, category five. Limbs will break off. But that tree, I'm telling you, even a bulldozer would have a difficult time. 
it would take a long time for a bulldozer to, root, to get that tree rooted up. Your faith is supposed to be like that and even more. But something is missing. And with the help of Almighty God, I am going to unlock the mystery. And we are going to literally turn this world upside down. God bless you. Faith toward God. And he who comes to God must believe that he is. I am not just going to say it. I want to show you in the scripture. So when we come back next week, we're going to dive in. And we're going to go deep. You're going to have to use up your bioluminescence. Because we're going where the sun doesn't shine. Stand with me, please. I was coming this morning and I was thinking about so many things that needs to be taught where the church is concerned. And so little time. And when I say little time, is based on people are so, would I say, busy with the affairs of this life. And we have very little time for God and the things of God. If you notice, Every single day, there is so much things that is putting a demand on you. That, that, that even, even in reading, we can barely sometimes fit a little time. So, we, you know, we do a quick look at devotional thing. <laughs> we have to do curry in a hurry. And that's dangerous, you know. You don't want to play. You don't want to play with curry. You better make sure that curry cook properly. Oh my God! Run your belly, sister, my dear. I have the personal first-hand experience. In 2003, when I came to do a convention in Toronto, and they they put my wife to stay with three different families for the five weeks. So it's five or six weeks. Six weeks. No, five weeks. We spend two weeks with one person, one week here, one week there. Then we come back and spend the other third week with that person and go home. The second place that they send us, they cook curry the evening when we go the first evening. Then cook curry. And I was suspicious about the curry, no? Because when I look at the curry, I said, this not look like Jamaican curry, no? This not, this not look like how we cook curry, no? It kind of look one way. It, look, it have a palish look. It, it kind of... And in the night, Sister Leslie, I kid you not, I lie not. While me, I use my wife, stand up at the door and wait for me. And as soon as me slip out, she sleeping. And by the time me go in, I better me. I, I, we were back and forth. They literally had to take us to a walk-in clinic. And the man said, what did you have for, what, for dinner? And he said, oh, we had curry chicken. He said, I think it's the curry. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things you can't hurry it. It takes time to make sure that it's properly cooked, properly digested. Because if it doesn't, it can create some problems and disturb your evening. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I believe that the time has come that we cannot go looking for entertainment anymore. 
Many places, they think that what God's people want is entertainment. So we sing a lot of fast songs, a lot of upbeat songs. And you know when certain songs going, man, it gets into your bone. Like I was telling my wife Friday morning, I was doing something outside, and she left to go somewhere. And they had a, a nurse, I think, this lady coming to take care of a lady's mom, the neighbor in front of us. And I could hear the music from down on the street coming in. And it's an Indian, so it's the Indian. And boy, when the lady come up then, all of a sudden me feel, I, I begin to <laughs> see myself. And, 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 I, and I'm saying, <laughs> all of a sudden the anointing of the, you know. <laughs> I could see myself dancing. And I'm not a dancer. But the music got into my bone. We are not here to be entertained. We're here to be edified. We're here to be what? Equipped. So when you leave out of the meeting, you're supposed to be leaving with tools that will aid you to deal with life and godliness. And you are walking in faith exactly the way that God intends for you to walk in it. That when you are faced with any circumstances in life, that while God may not move you out of some of them, you're able to go through the storm, you're able to go through the fire, and come out on the other side stronger stronger. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity that you have provided for us and have given to us that we could come together, coming from different places, to come together in this room here in Mississauga, Square One, Sheridan College. Father, thank you for this place. I believe with all of my heart that this room was built for us for such a time as this, that you are allowing it as a message Father, to impart certain things in our life as you take us back to square one. And we're going to move from square one. And Father, when we move from square one, we must be moving with more efficiency, more effectively. We are moving with greater authority, with greater power. We're moving, Father, knowing and understanding certain things exactly the way how it is meant to work and what it is meant to bring and accomplish. So, Father, you are equipping us like you have never done before. And there are those of us, Father, that still want to stay in the shallow. But, Father, you are literally by the spirit you are literally pulling us pulling us pulling us and father our spirit as as as, as david said when thou said seek in my face my heart cried out my heart responded and said yes thy face lord will i seek your face lord will i seek and so today father i thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in this room. I thank you for the word. Because man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of those that are watching and listening from around the world. Father, I, I, I am in awe when I hear so many sharing the experience that they are coming into. And Father, they are watching how much more when we are even in the immediate presence. My God. I thank thank you for the impartation today. I thank you that more has been given. Thank you that more has been released, more has been received. And we're not walking out of this room the way we came in. So devil, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not afraid of you. We are not afraid of what you can do. We're not afraid of what you can bring against us because my Lord has given me authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all your ability. And I'm not going to sit back and suck my thumb and cry like a baby. I know who I am and I know whose I am. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to trample upon the lion and upon the young lion, the other, the serpent, the viper.
You shall trample on the feet because you have set your love upon him. The Lord has lifted you up and he has set you up an eye because you know his name. Father, thank you that in the day of trouble, when we call, you hears and you deliver us. So, Father, we will not worry. We will not worry. Worry is no longer a part of our destiny. We are living by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I am living by faith today. I will be living by faith tomorrow. I will be living by faith throughout this week. I will be living by faith throughout the month. I will be living by faith throughout the year. And by faith. Faith, I know that God is with me and God is for me. Therefore, who or what can be against me? So, Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for what you're bringing us into. I thank you that you are realigning us. And faith is being redefined for us to function in faith the way that you meant it. Father, we read about it. We see example of it. We're not, we do not only want to read about it. We do not only want to see the examples and talk about the examples. We want to be the examples. Because there are children that some of us have in our lives that need to see those things and experience those things. As Paul said to Timothy, that the faith that was in your grandmother and your mother, I'm seeing that faith in you. So Father, I pray that we will understand that it's not just about us. We have our children that we need to leave a legacy of faith with. We have friends and family around us that we need to, let. they need to see something. That when we talk, they know that we're not a bag of talk. We're not a bag of talk, but action, 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 because the just shall live by faith. And we walk by faith and not by sight. Father, thank you for hearing and thank you for answering. And thank you for the ministry of the word and the spirit. And that as we leave, you're going with us. You will keep us until we come together again. We continue to give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise as you continue to be who you are to us. And Father, we appreciate you. We love you. And because we love you, we give ourselves so that your word can bear fruit in our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray and I believe that it is so. So be it. So be it. So be it. So be it. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Have an unusual week. I said, have an unusual week. Look for it. Look for it. Have an unusual week. God bless you. I love you. And I'm going to ask you to spread my love around. Give the person beside you a hug and tell them, this is coming from pastor. <laughs> This is 